lunar module, commonly called the LEM, America's fourth manned spacecraft following Mercury, Gemini, and its mate Apollo on the path to the moon. But this spacecraft is the first in a new generation, not designed to carry men into space, not built to return men safely to Earth, Instead, this far-fetched flying machine, so ungainly looking, will serve as a ferry boat, carrying two American astronauts from the Apollo mothership to a landing on the moon and back. But that historic mission, planned for midsummer, will not be flown at all unless we've proved that Lem, with man at the controls, can perform perfectly in space. Proving it is the goal of Apollo 9. This is a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 9. This morning, the launch of astronauts McDivitt, Schweikert, and Scott. Brought to you by Western Electric, manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from the CBS News Apollo headquarters, Kennedy Space Center, correspondent Walter Cronkite. And it's T-minus 58 minutes and counting here at the Kennedy Space Center with the Apollo 5 rocket and the Apollo 9 spacecraft atop it waiting to go at 11 a.m. Eastern time with the countdown going perfectly so far. The astronauts are buttoned into the command module there atop that 363-foot-high rocket complex ready to go on what perhaps is the most dangerous mission yet in the Apollo program and a vital one if we are to get a man on the moon this year, as the late President Kennedy promised. The flight is to test, as we heard a moment ago, the LEM, the lunar module, which will be the craft to ferry man from the command module to the surface of the moon and back. It does not operate in an Earth environment. It operates only in space, the first true space vehicle we've ever had, therefore. And the men who ride it on this mission in Earth orbit, 150 miles or so above the Earth, must get it back to the command module after they once detach from that command ship in order to return to Earth. The major events on this mission today, the launch, of course, which is always a hair-raising part of any space mission, and then the uh, uh, docking of the command ship uh, with the lunar module, the extraction of it from uh, its garage that is carried into space with it at the top of that spacecraft, uh, top of the rocket, and that is the principal mission for today. And then on Wednesday, the first test of the lunar module's descent engine. On Thursday, a spacewalk by 30 three-year-old Rusty Schweikert, youngest member of this crew, the LEM pilot. He will take a two-hour and 15-minute walk from the LEM back to the spacecraft, to the command ship, and then back to the LEM again. And on Friday, the LEM flies for the first time on its own. The crew, Colonel James McDubert, U.S. Air Force, 39 years old, veteran of the Korean War and many combat flights there, the veteran of the Gemini 4 flight, when the late Ed White made his space walk. The command module pilot is Colonel David Scott, 36 years old, a veteran of the Gemini 8 flight, which was the only flight that had to come back and make an emergency landing in all of our 18 flights in the space program. And the lunar module pilot, a civilian, but uh, a National Guard flyer who had some active service in the Air Force, Russell Schweikert, 33 years old. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 9 will continue in a moment. You know what that looks yeah. like? Some licorice sticking up in a candy store. It looks like a porcupine to me. It looks like the inside of a telephone, it is. The receiver. At our Western Electric plant in Indianapolis recently, some school children watched us make new telephones for the Bell Telephone Companies. This is the way they saw it. She's taking um, the telephones and she's putting them up to the machine and then the extra plastic comes off and, and then she puts them on the um, conveyor belt. There's two conveyor belts going back and forth. One's going that way and one's going this way. They're taking the uh, housing out of a, a molding machine. 
And he was cutting the extra plastic off the telephones. She's got all kinds of wires, and she has to take about a couple of every one and put them in the telephones. You have to have every one exactly in order, or it'll mess up the whole telephone. She's taking the telephones, and she's testing them. Well, if the lights show up, she knows that the phone's okay. First, they screw the dial on, then they send it on down the line, and they put the um, cord on, then they put the base on, then they test it, see if it works, and then it goes to the boxing, boxing part of Western Electric. And they send it on a, like, conveyor, only it's like a roller coaster, and then they go down to the basement, and then somebody puts them in a truck and takes them down to Bell Telephone Company. Children have a way of simplifying, seeing clearly what is most important. You have to have everyone exactly in order, or it'll mess up the whole telephone. On our job in the Bell system, Western Electric is very careful not to mess things up. Yeah, how about that? It's T minus 53 minutes and counting. There haven't been any delays in this count. There was a, a brief uh, flurry of activity out on the launch battle earlier this morning when a helium valve that pressurizes uh, the third stage of the spacecraft and the booster, that is, uh, seemed to be malfunctioning, but uh, that was corrected in short order. It did delay the astronauts' uh, departure from their uh, crew quarters, however, and their ingress uh, into the uh, spacecraft by about eight or ten minutes, but apparently they've caught up the time, and the, and the countdown is going as planned and is on time for an 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on-time departure. The duration of this flight is to be nine days, 22 hours, and 47 minutes, uh, with splashdown at about 10.15, 10.17, something like that, a week from Thursday uh, in the Atlantic, 185 miles southwest of Bermuda, where the helicopter carrier, the Guadalcanal, will be standing by for the recovery. You see the uh, venting of the liquid oxygen uh, in the spacecraft there a moment ago that full 363 feet six million six hundred thousand pounds of it standing there it weighs half again as much as a small destroyer you might also note in the background a very heavy cloud cover because that is the condition here uh, in Florida this morning on this coast at any rate the sky is supposed to be solidly overcast at around 5,000 feet at launch time, some 52 minutes from now, and that uh, solid cloud cover is just about uh, over us now. Winds are supposed to be from the east-southeast at 10 knots. That's not the most favorable direction blowing back onto the Merritt Island uh, Space Center here, but uh, it is acceptable. Temperature around 64 degrees. None of those conditions are perfect. Uh, the visibility won't be very good on this uh, launch from the ground, but they are acceptable conditions for launch. During this flight, there also will be a live television from space, the first test of a new Westinghouse uh, television camera, the camera that will be used on the surface of the moon. The previous cameras we have seen, RCA cameras, which have worked so well in the past, have been supplanted now by this Westinghouse camera, uh, which was the plan all along, a camera that can stand the long pressurization on the moon. It uh, weighs almost twice what that former camera did. We'll have uh, the two transmissions, one on Wednesday morning around 9.30. That will be just to the interior of the lunar landing module. And then two, uh, around 2 o'clock on Thursday afternoon of this week, the walk of Rusty Schweikert outside the spacecraft. Let's look at the astronaut activities as they uh, uh, got prepared for this flight this morning, as they awoke at 5.45 at their crew quarters some five miles from launch pad 39A. Here is the command pilot. Uh, that was not McDivitt. I thought at first it was. He, his hairline is very similar to McDivitt's. One of the uh, several technicians who were at the uh, breakfast with them. Here they are as they begin to uh, suit up. This is Scott. 
This is Rusty Schweikert, the lunar module pilot. Schweikert, 33, MIT graduate. Scott uh, is 36. This is McDivitt, the commander, 39-year-old uh, man who is in charge of this flight and has to make the go-no-go -go decisions. Here they are in their uh, spacesuits carrying their portable air conditioner equipment as they leave the crew quarters for the special van, which takes them the five miles along these roads across the marshes of the Cape and Merritt Island to the launch pad. At this point, they were running about uh, five to eight minutes late because of that delay with the helium regulator I mentioned. There was some delay in getting them started from the crew quarters. The uh, fan sat there for several more minutes. Inside, they can link up with uh, other air conditioner equipment if they desire, or stay on the portable equipment which they carry with them. The crew at the crew quarters sends them off with a good luck sign. This their last ride in a wheeled vehicle. Their next trip is going to be on top of that Saturn V with its seven and a half million pounds of thrust in the first stage. more powerful than any vehicle man has ever built. And there you get a good view of it. A little earlier this morning as the van approached, which you see there in the bottom of the picture. That structure has to hold up this whole six and a half million pounds of vehicle and all of its fuel. The fuel is included in that six and million, six hundred thousand pounds. The venting you see is of that liquid oxygen, which is down in the 200, minus 200 degree range and boils off in an earth environment. As it sits there on the pad, they have to continually push more of the liquid oxygen into the vehicle because it does boil away. That's what you see, the steam vent to the liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen is used as the oxidizer. Since there is no oxygen in space, and it takes uh, oxygen to, to burn anything, including a rocket engine, you've got to take your oxygen along with you. So they take it along in a liquid form. The astronauts you saw just there crossing over with the suit technicians into a elevator which takes them up to the top of the rector base and then over to another elevator on up the total distance of 320 feet to where their command ship rests atop the Saturn V rocket. There to the first level If they were coming back down that way, and here you see them crossing the short catwalk from the umbilical tower and that high-speed elevator over to the white room. Here the technicians have been working through the night, and for the last four hours, the backup crew has been working in there, testing all of the systems of the of the spacecraft waiting for the prime crew, the ones that will fly today, to arrive. They are then helped into the spacecraft and they themselves check out everything and also check the pressurization of their suits, which are pressurized in case anything should happen in space and they lost pressure in the spacecraft itself. They could still get back safely and survive the hostile environment of outer space. Nelson Benton is at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, and I wonder, Nelson, what the mood is at Houston this morning on the moments before this crucial flight. 
Walter, the atmosphere here was described in one word by Eugene Kranz, who's the flight director for Apollo 9. He called it electric. And perhaps the reason for that electricity is this thing that's standing behind me. That's the lunar module. It must behave properly on its own with two astronauts in it. It must behave properly with relation to the command service module, the sort of mothership for the flight. It is the trickiest mission that uh, Apollo astronauts have tried to fly so far, indeed the trickiest mission of manned space flight. It is more difficult, officials say, than the historic moon flight of Apollo 8. And many officials here say that they would be surprised if Apollo 9 does all that it is setting out to do. The Mission Control Center, which is the nerve center for this flight, was powered up yesterday at about midday. There are more people there now than there have been for previous missions because there must be people and control consoles for the limb and for the portable life support system, the uh, packs that the astronauts will use while the spacecraft are depressurized. All told, there are about 30% more people in the entire mission control center than there have been on previous flights. It's configured just about the same way as it will be when we make the flight to the moon. The major concern, of course, is the first five days in which the limb will be worked out. That's the busy part. And then there are five rather uneventful days. And some say, well, why have those uneventful days? Well, Chris Kraft, who's the director of flight operations, said that any time you put three men on top of a Saturn, you get all out of the flight that you can. Walter? Nelson, we'll be coming back to you from time to time at Houston, the manned space center, where, of course, the controls for this flight uh, are. Uh, here at the Merritt Island uh, Space Center, the Kennedy Space Center, as it's called, it's not really Cape Kennedy any longer, you know. We're back a few miles and a little north of Cape, the Cape itself. But here, uh, they control only the launch phase, and then the control goes immediately to Houston. And Nelson will be checking in with you frequently during the next uh, 10 days, and particularly in the next five, as you point out, which are the crucial ones uh, to uh, this mission. There is a, a, uh, an experiment, however, later on in the flight that is going to be conducted that uh, would we'd be remiss if we didn't mention at all, because perhaps it has as, it'll have as much influence on our, all of our futures as anything else that takes place on this flight. And that is, in the last a couple of days of the flight, some, some uh, photography from orbit uh, checking our environment. We have found that we can tell from space a great deal about uh, this world we live in with uh, photographs. We can tell, for instance, how crops are doing, where they're likely to fail. We can begin to see the colors change. With infrared photography, we can tell something about the temperatures of the oceans and where fish are likely to be. Tell something about uh, anomalies, uh, things that are going wrong with the crust of our Earth. They even believe that eventually they may be able to tell something about population with infrared photography by just the heat of the number of bodies there below. Well, a series of experiments and photographs over two days in the latter part of this flight is going to add a great deal to our store of knowledge in that new science, which may have a great deal to do with all of our futures. This lunar module, which uh, we're talking about so much today, we might explain to you just a little bit, something of it here, before uh, we get into more detail in the flight itself. 